Greetings, everyone. Thanks for uh, for tuning in once again. Christian Barker here, and uh, this is the latest in my ongoing series of uh, IG Live interviews from my uh, coming at you live from uh, quarantine in my living room here in uh, Sixth Avenue, Singapore. Uh, I'm pleased to have you with us today, and we will be speaking. Um, with uh, a gentleman who is, uh, as I say, most certainly one of um, the most erudite, articulate, and uh, and fascinating individuals I've had the um, the pleasure of uh, of interviewing in the past, uh, a fellow by the name of Hugh Mason. Now, Hugh um, started out his career working in television production in the United Kingdom, um, primarily on programs uh, focused on. Uh, on the world of the future, and uh, you know, a little over a decade ago, he came out to uh, to Singapore and uh, and moved into helping to shape the world of the future. Hugh um, ran a uh, a pivotal uh, startup accelerator called uh, JFDI. Just flip and do it. The acronym stands for. And uh, during his time as CEO there, he was responsible for. Uh, for mentoring and uh, fostering the success of uh, 70 plus uh, startups here in uh, in Singapore. And Hugh is joining us right now. The other remarkable thing about, about Hugh is that he has just uh, survived a, uh, a bout of, uh, of COVID-19 um, and uh, is in fact the, uh, the only person I know who's uh, who suffered from that uh, that affliction? So I'm I'm really curious to speak with him about uh, about that experience and uh, and how he came through. Not sure where we're, where we're hanging. I'm just going to try this connection again, Hugh. Oof. Hey, ah, Christian. Hey, Hugh. Great to Good speak to with see you. you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you're the best dressed man that I've seen on Instagram all day, <laughs> as ever. Uh, I'm, I'm doing my best, and, and I am. Um, I do like to reveal that I'm, I'm doing it complete newsreader style. So I do have my uh, my, my shorts and, and no shoes on. Uh, but uh, but from yeah, it's, it's party down below and business up top. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> how how are you keeping, Hugh? I'm very well, thanks. Yeah, I went through this strange experience of COVID-19 about eight weeks yeah. back with my wife. And uh, oh, I'm very glad to have left that behind. And uh, great to have my sense of smell back. Uh, if anyone mm. saw the videos on that, I lost my sense of smell for about three weeks. And I, I recommend to anybody, if you haven't sniffed something today, go and enjoy sniffing. Because okay. it's one of those things that you really miss if, if forever you, you, know, you might lose it. So. I think there's, there's, there's a lot out of this experience that, you know, with many things that we have taken for granted that, uh, that once we emerge into some semblance of normalcy, um, you know, we'll come to appreciate a lot of things that were, that were you know, yeah, uh, considered every day that, uh, that we've been deprived of, um, obviously smelling for you. <laughs> yeah, and I guess being, just being together with people, I, I tried going into the office today. I don't know if anyone else uh, who's joined this has been uh, trying to go back to work, but it was really strange to have people around me and then kind of mm. not, not quite know what to do like I, I, I kind of come and say hi to people and realize oh we're supposed to stand a meter apart oh and then I sat and ate my lunch they put up these very clever sort of plastic screens so we could sit opposite each other and have lunch but there was okay. a plastic screen between and then you and then you sort of because you're eating you take your mask off and and then it feels rather sort of naked it feels like whoa is this am I allowed to do this <laughs> Okay. And, you know, and one of the things I loved about Singapore is the sense of just freedom of being able to kind of, you know, not have to worry too much about the clothes that you wear. If it rains, you get wet and then you get dry, all that stuff. And I feel like all of that freedom's disappeared from me, to be honest. Um, so I'm looking forward to having that back. I'm looking forward to seeing friends. And it's great to see you here on, on Instagram in the meantime. Yeah, I'm, I'm pleased to, um, to be your inaugural debut on the, uh, on the Instagram Live. I've, I've only been doing it my... Uh, myself for a little over a, over a month but uh yeah needs must so uh, it's good to good to keep in practice while uh, while stuck here at home um i would like to you know and and I'll, I'll say to anyone who's listening um you know i've interviewed Hugh two or three times i think in the past and and had some you know really fascinating 
conversations about um, about where the world is heading and how the world might change and evolve. Um, a lot of it due to tech, but just due to uh, social changes and cultural changes and, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, Hugh, I would love to speak a little bit later with you in, in this conversation mm. about um, about your kind of uh, uh, prophecies for uh, for where we're heading or, or where we might uh, where we might head. But um, but yeah, look, let's let's start by as I say, you're the you're the only person I know. Who um, who has uh, you know, who, who won the sad roulette wheel of uh, of uh, contracting the uh, the coronavirus? So, um, can you tell us a little bit about the experience for those unlike me who haven't seen sure. your video? Sure. So, um, you know, sometimes people say, oh, it's just like the flu. And in some senses, they're right that, you know, the, the, the symptoms that I got anyway um, coming on were just like flu. Um, I don't know if anyone was watching on the news, but um, Prime Minister um, Boris Johnson in the UK must have got COVID-19 exactly the same time as me. And the first week is fairly mild for everybody. Um, mm. You just have a cough temperature things like that but it's the beginning of the second week when you really go one of two ways either you kind of go down into the intensive care unit which is where boris johnson went or you kind of recover which is what i did um yeah. and if you do go into intensive care and it's something i believe about one in 20 people ends up in intensive care and the age is a huge factor mm -hmm. um if you do go into intensive care, then um, you've got like a 20, 30 percent chance of frankly not coming out. It's, it's actually wow. if you end up with uh, incubation, so intubation, the ventilator. Mm. It's, so I don't want to sound down about this, but it was one of those strange experiences for me. I've, I've been a filmmaker earlier in my life and I've made lots of science films. And I filmed in hospitals, but I'd never spent a night in a hospital before. And it was really curious to kind of go from nothing, no experience of staying in a hospital to suddenly being in an isolation room all on my own. And it was like best way I can describe it is like being abducted by aliens. So every kind of four hours, these nurses would come in and go ha, 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 like this with all this protective equipment on. And, and, um, and then they kind of disappear as quickly as they could. And they do this, they're like double doors on the isolation room. And they do this sort of quick change thing out of the protective equipment, throw that away, and then go on to the next patients. So it was one of those strange things for about four or five days. I was thinking, well, which way is this going to go? You know, will I see my family again? You know, will I see my son again? Mm -hmm. um, it was quite intense. And uh, so, and then the loss of smell was very strange, but the, the symptoms people get are very varied. Some people after the event don't get their sense of smell back. I'm lucky we did. Um, I did. And uh, I didn't get any of the strange effects like sort of rashes on my toes and things like that, mm -hmm. which other people mm -hmm. are getting as well now. So, Anyway, um, I think it's, um, it's, in, it's, I mean, it's a curious disease from a medical point of view. And I think in terms of the sort of obviously economic impact, it's, it's the biggest thing in, a, in our lives. Um, it's yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely huge. Well, so. well go, go, going back to, to what you were saying, and I, I mentioned this to you that, that you know, watching, um, and I only realized that, that, you'd, um, that you'd contracted the thing when, when I saw the, the video that you posted on, on YouTube and, and LinkedIn when you were actually leaving uh, the post-hospital uh, quarantine, the, the two weeks that you spent in, in a hotel. But, um, you know, what really, you know, struck me was when you mentioned that before you'd gone into the hospital, um, you had to have a conversation with, I, I think you said your son is, is 12 mm. or, or 13, and have a conversation mm. with him to say, you know, look, there's, there's, a, there's a chance that you won't ever see me again. How, how, how did that... Well, it was kind of pretty feel? intense. I mean, I, I, mm. I, I didn't put it like that exactly, mm -hmm. but I, I did mm -hmm. say, you know, um, this is a serious disease. Um, and um, sometimes, depending on which way it goes, um, you know, if I'm in isolation, if and this is, by the way, before I had the diagnosis. So I, I'd had the test and we were waiting overnight for the result. So I said to him, um, you know, if I am positive, then we won't be able to see each other face to face. Um, yeah. And... Uh, in fact, to be honest, you won't be able to even visit the ward. So that was quite an intense thing to say. Um, I must admit, I'm very glad to have got a disease like this in a time when we've got, uh, you know, WhatsApp and, and so on, because mm. uh, without it, it, it would have been very, very isolating indeed. And, and as a, we were able to stay in touch, so that helped. And in fact, to be honest, one of the, the biggest things, positives for me, I don't know if anyone else has had this strange experience over the COVID-19 time, you end up connecting with people that you didn't know that well, um, in new ways. So I had people, um, I basically made this little video because a friend had, had asked me, what's it like in the isolation ward? So I just sort of made a little video. Um, and then um, hundreds of people started writing to me. I mean, like students that I taught six or seven years ago, people that I'd mentored 10 years ago, people I worked with like 15 years ago. 
And when I was lying there in bed, I must admit the thing I missed most of all was the outside. And the best thing was that people took me on virtual dog walks. So I had a virtual <laughs> dog walk in Auckland. Uh, I yeah. had another one in the west of England. And, and it was just great to see the outside and to think, wow, how beautiful the world is. What a wonderful privilege it is to be alive. Um, so that was great. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel very, very lucky to have a dog of my own and being able to take her out for uh, many, many walks. She's probably there going, not another walk, not another walk. Um, <laughs> so, so I have a question on that for you with the dogs. I've just been having a load of dog dreams lately. I've never had dog dreams before. Before you got, did you kind of grow up with dogs or was it something that you kind yeah. of aspired to? You, yeah, no, 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 no. I had, I had dogs as a boy. So I, I've, I've never had a dog, but in the last like week, I've had two or three nights when I've dreamed about taking a dog for a walk. So I don't know what that means, Dr. Christian, but I'm, perhaps you can tell me. I don't know. And I would suggest um, get a dog. if you want a dog <laughs> who's, who's going to help you get some exercise, don't get a miniature schnauzer because they're, oh. uh, um, they're a little bit slow and a little bit ponderous and they like to sniff everything. But, right. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so right. um, speaking of, of sniffing things. Um, so so where, where do you think that, that you perhaps contracted um, this thing? I, I think you're, you're still a mystery. Total mystery, right? total mystery. I mean, it was very interesting to get called. I mean, I knew it was going to happen after a positive diagnosis, but the, you know, the contact tracing people in Singapore are very thorough. I must have mm. spent about two hours in total on the phone with them, going over everything, everywhere I'd been, where I'd sat in cafes, things like that. Um, and still no idea. Um, what was interesting when they, re they reported it very openly and transparently here in Singapore. So I, th I was told that my case number was 728. And if anyone goes back and checks that, you'll see that that's actually described online as a 22 year old Singaporean citizen, which regrettably is not me. Um, so I'm not quite sure who the, the number case 729 is more like me. It's a 53 year old British permanent resident. Um, okay. However, um, the place that they say on, on that, it suggests that I'm linked to a cluster I've never been anywhere near. So, so I don't, I've had no idea how I contracted it at all, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. And uh, were you in the hospital with your wife or were you, uh, because, or, or, or was her diagnosis later than yours? Because I, I know you I, did. Uh... It was a, she was a diagnosis a day later. So they, you know, they mm -hmm. do that thing where they fan out from you you know, to the people that you've contacted. Yeah. So um, uh, she was actually in a separate hospital, um, which was sort of weird, somewhere else on the island. Um, but then after about five days, when they decided that we were not going in a bad way, they put us together in quarantine. So we spent two weeks then, uh, two and a bit weeks um, in a room together with a bathroom. Um, and I have to say, I'm very pleased that after, you know, 20 odd years of, uh, of marriage, we managed to avoid having any arguments. So. <laughs> That is, it's absolutely yeah. remarkable. I do not know how you, uh, how you did that. And, and how was that, that hotel experience? Because as you know, I, I watched your, you did a short video on, on that as well, where, you know, and, and, and I think it would be easy for people to think, oh, they're put up in a, in a, in a nice hotel. You look like you're in a nice little resorty place, which was even called D Resort, I believe. Mm. Um, yep. but, uh, but yeah, it's, it, it's not a holiday, right? Well, it wasn't. I, I, must admit, I can't, can't tell you anything about the resort. I mean, all I saw was, you know, they, they, we arrived in a minibus. We were kind of sign in like, like joining the army or something. And then we were kind of put into this room. Um, and that was it for the next two weeks. So food arrives in a bag outside. I've, I've no idea. I'm not sure it's a very nice hotel. Uh, I never got to see it. What I did get to see out the window was the, um, uh, was the, the sea, which I was incredibly grateful for. There was, we were right by Passeris Park. Yeah. Um, and I, it was just lovely to be able to see the open world outside. And a couple of friends came by and waved, which I really appreciated. So while they were walking their dogs or just out for a cycle or something, they'd stop and kind of wave and, uh, they're slightly too far to shout at each other, but we could see each other and wave, so that that felt connected. Yeah, and you were fortunate in in having a, a balcony. I can only imagine what it would be to be, yeah. you know, quarantined in a you know a tiny flat in Hong Kong or something, for instance. Which uh, yeah, or, or or even Australia. I spoke last night to a guy in his uh, late seventies, who a uh, British guy who'd been quarantined in Australia for a month mm. um, <laughs> in one room. Um, he yeah. said that the good luckily it was very high on a hill so there were lots of things to look out of the window with but he and his wife were in, in for a month so yeah uh, i think we were very lucky yeah yeah well um i'm i'm super glad to hear that you were uh, that you got through i mean you know was was there a moment there i i, I think you mentioned where, where it was on the borderline where it could have become um, yeah i mean 
Definitely. I mean, I, I, they were checking me every four hours when I was in the isolation ward. And the thing they were looking for was uh, my oxygen saturation dipping. So there's that thing, if anyone's you've been in hospital, they think that thing on the end of your finger and it mm, shines yeah. a light into your fingers. To, and from that, they can tell, is your body, is your blood um, got plenty of oxygen in it? And my oxygen saturation never dipped, which meant basically my lungs were working and that the you know, metabolism was OK. So I wasn't going to. Uh, I wasn't going to go down. Uh, that was fairly clear after a few after a few days, and there were no other strange effects. Um, I, but at that time, it was interesting. I mean, I, you know, you, we all expect, don't we, that doctors kind of have the answers and they know um, all about these diseases. But this is a new disease, and you know, the guys were very clear to me. I mean, I, as a former science journalist, I was asking them, you know, how has it been trying to understand this disease? And they were saying, well, it's actually very hard to place people on a kind of a pathway you know mm. is this person three days in or seven days in or wherever what happens next and there was such a strange array of symptoms um, that was really quite um, confusing for them um, and um, it isn't quite like anything else they've, they've ever seen before uh, so you know tens of thousands of scientific papers now written so lo lots of clarity becoming uh, clearer over time but it but it's a it's a strange disease Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I was, I was just, uh, just reading the, well, recently, you know, uh, the New York Times had its, its front page with the, uh, you know, kind of listing all of the, the names of the 100,000 um, individuals who've, who've tragically died in the United States. And um, online, or, well, I'm sorry, in the, in the app version, um, they did quite a quite a remarkable um, presentation of it with you know a lot of the abbreviated uh, obituaries for for many of those interviews and and what you know really struck me was a lot of the talk has been about oh okay if you're in your twenties you don't need to worry or if you're in your thirties you don't need to worry but there have been a lot a lot in in well even that young but also you know young forty five year old whippersnappers like myself and. Mm. Uh, and, and mm. early early fifties, it's it's something that's it, it's not just the over eighties. And uh, you know, I've heard a lot of cynics saying, "Oh, these eighty-five year olds, they were going to die anyway," or these ninety-five year olds. Um, so why are we destroying the economy? But it's uh, well, it's, it's a, a lot. It's a yeah. And it, well, I think the interesting thing also is that human beings are very bad at assessing risks, aren't they? So when we're faced mm. with something, particularly risks where there's a low level of risk, but when it happens, it's appalling. So mm -hmm. nuclear, you know, nuclear disasters are like that. Most of the time, nuclear power stations are perfectly safe. And then once in a while, one goes wrong. And when it goes wrong, it's a Chernobyl or a Three Mile Island, and it's a disaster. And it's a huge, huge impact. I think people call those black swan events, don't they? Something like that. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and I guess COVID-19 is a bit like that. If it doesn't happen to you, it feels like it's a low risk thing. Um, and it doesn't feel real. And yet the truth is, if you're in the UK, one in a thousand British people has died, right? One in a thousand, 0.1% of Brits have died from COVID-19, right? Who were not going to die other, I mean, they might have been going to die of something at some point, but they've been mm. robbed of years of their lives. And yep. if you're 85, does that mean you're any less deserving of the next 10 years of your life? You know, I think I that's think no. a really hard calculus to, to, you know, to make. So I think one of the challenges for this in countries, especially like, uh, you know, Vietnam, Singapore, uh, Taiwan, uh, Australia, these countries have all handled COVID-19 very well. So the risk mm. doesn't feel very strong. It feels, and I think in Singapore, one in 200,000 people has died. So yeah. it's, it's a very low, the chances of you knowing someone who are infected here are pretty low and the chances of knowing yeah. anyone who had died are, are minuscule. So mm. we've not had any celebrities die in Singapore. So again, that's the kind of thing where, you know, people... <laughs> People, well, we're, uh, we're lucky we have no celebrities here, really. So, um, so that, that apart would... from, well, apart from yourself, Christian, you know, and I'm glad <laughs> that you haven't died. I'm actually very glad you're here. Just like I'm, I say, I'm, that. I'm more infamous, I think, or notorious than uh, than famous, most uh, most certainly. <laughs> um, now, Singapore has managed this thing incredibly well, uh, as you say. You know, it, it was. I mean, it, it, there are flaws, obviously, and it, it could have been better. And we've seen numbers uh numbers going up but uh but when you when, when particularly when you compare the mortality rate to uh, to most other countries we're really um you know batting above uh punching above our weight however you want to however you want to say it aren't we yeah i think it's an astonishing i'm mean, just being incredibly grateful i mean i i could have got this disease in britain where i come from and mm. you know it and i 
the chances are I would have, I would have had either no care uh, mm. or very much worse care. And, and uh, I feel incredibly grateful for all that the Ministry of Health um, uh, and the Allied Services here did to cope. I, th I think it's excellent. And yeah, I mean, they, you know, the, the issue around the workers here, um, you, know, you could look back in retrospect and say, uh, maybe they should have spotted that one coming. Um, I, you know, it's easy with hindsight to say that kind of thing, isn't it? And yet, but that, that still, as you say, the point is that very few people have died. So people are getting care. Um, would those workers have got infected anyway if they'd been back home? You know, who knows? So, uh, I, I, you know, I, I give Singapore very high marks for the way they've handled this. I'm very, yeah. very grateful for being here. Yeah. And, and even that situation, and I, I don't want to concentrate on, on that specifically, but I think, you know, it's, it's been reappraised how, um, how the, the foreign workers in Singapore are going to be housed and, and perhaps the, uh, uh, just the treatment in general that they will receive. I've, I've long thought that transporting people around in the back of a flatbed truck in a first world country is, uh, uh, is kind of beyond the pale. Um, in general, though, you know this this situation it is it is driving just a huge number of, of changes. I'm I'm hearing in, in so many um, you know different situations that people are saying, oh, you know this we were on on the path to making this change with a horizon of, of ten years or twenty years, but now it's going to happen now. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think are some of the, the notable examples of, of you know big changes like that that we're going to um, we're going to see perhaps things that, that you know, um, it was it was on the horizon, but uh, but now hmm. we're going to have to be there. Well, it's, it's really interesting you ask that. I mean, one of the things I did when I was in quarantine was I started a business, of course, because oh. I'm an entrepreneur, right? Uh, and I recognized actually now that was a sort of defense mechanism. That was me overwhelmed by the experience of what I was going through and thinking, OK, what do I do? I feel I start businesses. That's what I do. So I started this with a bunch of friends to explore how we might make the world uh, reopen the world for business um, quicker after COVID-19. And as a result of doing that over the last eight weeks, um, uh, I've ended up talking with a lot of business leaders in small companies and big companies here, and they split very definitely into two groups. There's a bunch of people who um, have got you know, big organizations that have had business continuity plans and they have followed those plans and more or less they've worked and the stuff working from home has more or less worked. Sometimes there's been awkwardness around needing sort of wetting signatures and things like that, mm -hmm. legacy sort of mm -hmm. processes. But a lot of the time it's worked. The question now for those companies, which are very sort of process oriented, is what happens next? Because a business continuity plan gets you through the crisis, but it doesn't help you build for a new landscape. And then there's a separate bunch of people, I see a much smaller group of larger companies led by much more entrepreneurial people, some of whom have done astonishing stuff. And I was talking to one bakery in Malaysia, which has sort of two or three hundred workers, their business drops you know, in Malaysia. I don't know if you know, but there was a movement control order announced on, I think, 17th of March. And it was mm. just announced. And then the 18th, that was it. Everything's closed. Yeah. So these guys, you know, they supply baked goods to hotels and things like that. 90% revenue drop in one night, right? Poof, wow. wiped out. So um, they completely reinvented the business. They started, instead of supplying to hotels and, and large institutions like that, they ended up using all their vans to do customer delivery, uh, direct to consumer. Yeah. And within six weeks, we're back up to 45% of their previous revenue. Um, okay. And I think that's, and that's interesting to me because that was a very much still a founder-led business. Um, it's not one of these companies like many large companies where you have lots of sort of very smart people who've been trained about the theory of running business but have never actually worked on the front line this is a business where people have worked their way up from the bottom so in a very pragmatic sense when it came to reinventing the business they had the skills in-house and the resources to do that um, so there are some companies that have been very agile um, in adapting their business model and as you say bringing forward changes some of the surprising ones i'd heard were um, the way that culture has changed. So, for example, you and I both know that in, in Asian cultures, there's a lot more power distance often, as the sociologists mm. would call it. So yep. people are sometimes reticent about speaking up in a meeting. What's come across in many of the organizations I've worked with is that they're finding that nobody knows the rules. You know, this is the first time I've ever done Instagram Live. <laughs> okay. For a, lot of, yeah. a lot of people had never really done Zoom before. So actually that means when nobody knows the rules, then it's all up for reinvention. And what, 
a lot of company bosses told me is that they were really pleased that that staff from around Asia were feeling that they could contribute and just say what they thought in a way that they wouldn't have done if they were face to face. So I thought that was surprising the way that the sort of, you know, social dynamics change around it. Um, and then I think um, in terms of the sort of experience of work, it's been interesting. I was talking with a lady in uh, in Canada who who provides uh, support for people with long term chronic diseases. So she's oh. working with people who've got things like diabetes or, or other long term diseases, and they very much provide remote support for people. They put them into communities, and I think what that shows is that when someone you you can provide support to people at a distance, like workers working from home in new kinds of ways. So I think, for example, you know, some reasonably forward-looking employers have started including things like workplace clinics in their, in their offices so that you can okay. go and see a doctor. I have a hunch that we're going to see much more of that sort of stuff done in people's homes um, on a sort of telemedicine basis, that kind of thing. So the experience of being employed in future might be quite different. It might be that you're only in the office one or two days a week um, yeah. in some functions and um, but you still have some of the benefits you might have had. Um, so that's interesting. Yeah, I, I uh, was actually having a, a just a, a casual conversation with a, a friend of mine who's, who's head of people at a, um, a very, very large um, Singapore-based uh, startup, um, I guess you could call it. And, and you know, he was, he was saying, of course, we're, we're not going to entirely shift to working from home, but um, was, was saying, you know, that, 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 that sort of model, um, you know, does make sense now where you've got people perhaps working from home from th for three days of the week and then, uh, and then coming in uh, two days of the week. You know, I think there's, there's always been a huge underutilization of, of office space, you know, eight to 16 hours a day. You've got desks that if that is someone's desk that is sitting idle and, and, mm. and sitting empty. So, you know, perhaps this will... Uh, this will bring about, you know, a yeah. rethinking of, uh, of those sort of practices. And, you know, um, I think the great thing that's coming out of it is, and, and especially, you know, here in Asia, where, as you say, there's a very hierarchical um, approach uh, and a lot of bosses who, who probably, or leaders, bosses, executives, whatever you want to say, um, think that someone's bum needs to be in a seat or they need to be at a desk and they need to be clocking in at, at 9 a.m. in the morning and, and, you know, taking the allocated lunch hour and, and leaving at a certain time and they need to be within, within view. I guess we're, you know, um, hopefully learning now that it's about setting those goals and, and monitoring the, the KPIs and so long as the work is getting done and, and the, you know, uh, objectives are getting met, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, and I think what I see is that those stereotypes of, of, of kind of power distance structure are more to do with perhaps where you are in the hierarchy. When I spoke mm. to people at the top of large organizations, multinational organizations, it didn't really matter what background they were from, you know, which culture they would originally come from. They very much had the view that they had to be agile and change things. I think there's more of a sort of middle manager mindset, which is that one, as you say, about seeing bums mm. on seats, seeing people sat there. That's what sort of got to evolve. And I think for a lot of managers who've gained seniority through uh, experience and, and, and managing people face to face, it feels like all of their power has been taken away with them, from them. Mm. And the interesting flip side of that, I was talking to an industrial psychologist who, who's working with a lot of uh, people affected by COVID-19. And what she said to me was that actually a lot of workers found themselves feeling more psychologically safe you know, if you don't really like your boss or you don't like your colleagues, then actually it can feel much safer working at home because you can kind of turn them off or pretend, yeah. you know, that the, 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 the Internet's gone down or something if you really can't face them. So there are more ways of kind of hiding. So the, she said there's a strange thing happening as micromanagers try to sort of project power in terms of you know, micromanaging. Um, and in reverse to that, people actually had more ways of kind of keeping them at a distance. So there's an interesting whole series of sort of psychological games that are getting played out here as people figure out what does this work from home thing mean. Mm. Kind of reminds me of, do you remember, we're both old enough to remember SMS coming in. I don't know if you, if you, oh, you remember yeah. that. When you yeah. got your phone, so I think my wife and I were talking about this. The first time we both got cell phones, I think, was our hand phones, was about maybe 1993, something like that. Yeah. And at that time, it wasn't clear, like, could you SMS your boss? You know, is that allowed? Could yeah. you, you could clearly SMS your boss, someone to say I'm going to be late for a meeting, 
but is it um, could you ask someone out over sms you know is mm. that okay um, and, uh, and it takes a while, well, for us to get used to all of these new mediums and to figure out, you know, what the new rules are. And I think we're going through that now. There's a, there's a set of expectations from work, like how we dress, how we participate in meetings, um, and those are being upended, which is very interesting. So. Yeah. Do you think um, that this? You, you, well, uh, why, why it comes to mind is is. I've been reading a lot of Americans and particularly working in, in Silicon Valley and, you know, the Bay Area is just stupendously, eye-wateringly expensive uh, place to live where the average two-bedroom house is, is, you know, $2 million. Um, and they're all talking about, okay, well, now we're being freed up to, to perhaps work wherever we like to, so why don't I go where that $2 million will get me a, a gigantic, uh, you know, McMansion in... Um, in Utah or, or you know, wherever mm -hmm. it may be. Um, and, and what crosses my mind when I read that is, well, why does it need to be in Utah? And why does it need to be in the United States? Why totally. could you not be you know, moving anywhere else in the world? Um, and it certainly doesn't need to be in a city. So I, I, you know, I, I, do you think that this has kind of you know, sped up that whole process of... Yeah. Uh, I think it's forced it. I mean, I, I'm in an interesting situation. I, you know, as you said in the introduction, I, I set up one of the first with the, my with Meng, Meng Wong, my co-founder. Yeah. I set up one of the first startup accelerators here in Asia. I've actually just joined a startup accelerator myself, but okay. it's one based out of Silicon Valley called On Deck. Um, I'm going to be part of a cohort of 200 people, which is a huge number. Mm. Um, we'll all be linked together by Slack. Um, and a bunch of other technologies. And I'm fast, I, I kind of joined it partly because I've not actually spent that much time in the Valley. I've done my innovating in, in Europe and in, in Asia, not so much mm -hmm. in the Valley. Um, so I was kind of curious to connect there directly, but I'm also very curious to do that at a distance um, and to see how that works. Um, already some things have come across. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, you know, there's that thing where Americans always, um, they'll use phrases like across the country, by which mm -hmm. they mean across the United States. <laughs> they, yeah. There's an automatic assumption that we're talking about the U.S. If we start, which other country and other countries don't make that assumption always. You know, um, yeah. Uh, and uh, so there's a, there's a few things like that. So U.S. centricness, um, which are coming across straight away, uh, which are easy to fix and easy to address. A bit like, you know, I think for many of us, if you if you leave your own culture and you come to be in another, you you have to learn to avoid using metaphors and idioms that someone might not understand um, mm. if, if, they're, if they're speaking English as a second language. So I think there's a whole series of sort of adaptations like that to remote working. Uh, the stuff around expectations about what can you expect someone at a distance to follow through on or not. You know, we, uh, it was fascinating to me when I was in quarantine to set up this business. We ended up with a team of 20 people stretching from Silicon Valley to China, from Korea down to Australia. And to be coordinating that team of people, most of whom I'd never met, mm. towards a very focused group, you know, set of activities to try and explore whether a business was viable or not. That was fascinating. And it was, it was very possible when people uh, were willing to, um, when people were united by a common mission. I wonder if that's going to be a feature that we see, you know, if, if, if you're in a kind of sort of drudge job where it's something that needs to be done, but it's basically about process and cranking the handle, then I think maybe you have to be very disciplined about getting everyone online and making sure people deliver and blah, 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 mm. blah. If you've got a kind of purpose driven venture that people are part of, then I think that absolutely unites people across time and space. Uh, so yeah, I'm, uh, this is all to be explored and, and all very interesting. Yeah. I, I think it'd be nice to, live somewhere where I could, I could drive my, uh, my rental dollar further a little bit than, uh, than Singapore, but, but where would your dog like to live? Where would your schnauzer like to live? Oh, I, I, I don't know. I'm, you know, all dogs like to, like to romp free across, right. uh, across, across some acreage. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, that's, this, this, the, but I, look, I love living in a city, um, for all of the great things that, that a city offers. And the reason that, that cities have, have crystallized is you've got this centralization of, of resources where, you know, fortunately for you, a hospital was probably uh, a kilometer or two from, uh, from where you lived and, you know, easily accessible, um, which isn't the case if you live somewhere more remote. And also, you know, for those simple things, you can't pop down to the local 
Seven Eleven if you live uh, and, and grab that Coca Cola or you know whatever it is that you desire at that moment. Um, and do you think we but, miss a lot from that? I mean, I, by the way, I just seen that the simple gentleman's popped up to say, "Hey, gents, so hi to the simple gentleman." Um, hello. I, I, I wonder how much of that stuff we want. I mean, my wife has been noodling around while we were stuck in quarantine, looking at Canada. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of a place called Kelowna in British Columbia. Uh, it's mm -hmm. in the middle of a beautiful landscape. And one of the things we were doing as a sort of thought experiment is like, what would it be like to live somewhere in the middle of nowhere in Canada? Would we actually miss being able to buy the Coke and everything? And, mm -hmm. and we were reflecting on the fact that, um, you know, we, we were born into a world where, um, where, um, my, you know, my dad didn't get a newspaper. We used to get uh, the Radio Times, which told you what was on TV. Um, okay. And we had a rotary dial phone and we had a black and white TV and we had a public library. And was that OK? Was it any worse? Was it any better than that? I think it was just different, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and, I, and I realized that, you know, if, if you carry a set of expectations from, say, a city and then you go to somewhere that's more remote and you expect it to be just the same, then you're going to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. But if you enjoy that uh, sense of um, uh, freedom from noise that you have when you're away from it all. I think that's actually really positive. So, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 well, I, I think, you know, the, 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 the big element for me that had always made me think, okay, uh, you know, particularly my job really can be done from, uh, from literally anywhere. Um, and, and it can be as, as remote as all get out. But you know, I thought number one, educating my children. Uh, I want them to be able mm -hmm. to to go to a to a school um, and not have to go to a boarding school. And number two, you know, access to uh, to medical care. But I think perhaps um, that's where this situation is probably going to make a lot of people think. Well, the education thing that that can be done um, remotely. It's been we've done it successfully remotely for six months or twelve months or whatever. And if if the kids are okay without with sort of less socialization then it's fine and you know look maybe the medicine thing gets solved by by 5g although some are blaming coronavirus on 5g at the same time <laughs> the yeah same. people have all sorts of crazy theories in the end uh, for anyone who's watching 5g does not cause coronavirus just in case you're wondering but, but i was going to pick up the education thing because i think yeah. as you know education is a passion of mine and i come from a family of teachers and i love teaching myself um but and I wonder what education is going to turn into after COVID-19. Mm -hmm. There was a talk I was on last night, the Nobel Prize winning uh, vice chancellor of the Australian National University was on a, on, a, on a call yesterday I was listening in on. And you know, obviously that university has been through the same thing that many students have been through, trying to learn from home, try to adapt. But the more interesting questions he addressed to me were about actually what's the purpose of all this education? You know, we, we have an expectation, for example, for a degree that we bring people together. They spend three or four years, you know, in lecture halls and stuff. Does that really equip you for the world? Now that we've all been through COVID-19 and we can see that the world can change very suddenly and profoundly, mm is it really relevant to spend three years learning a load of very specific stuff that maybe become maybe wiped out and not irrelevant maybe become irrelevant in a few weeks in a few weeks mm. um i look at the way the world has changed since um may the 27th when i was diagnosed with covid19 and i think um wow what actual facts and stuff do i need to equip my son with and, and the stuff that we've been actually talking about is, is all about flexibility and dealing with your own emotions when you're faced with uncertainty uh, dealing with ambiguity you know i think it's it's easy to go through um an education process or to bring your kids up expecting to deliver you know if you do x you will get y and that's not true the world is much more unpredictable than that and i i don't know the conclusion i've come to anyway is that the, the most important thing i can give my son is the is the ability to cope with change uh, mm. because he's going to meet lots of that and thanks to valaine i can see in brazil there who's saying um yes that education is extremely important yeah it sounds yeah. like we're all aligned on that what's the most important thing you've taught your kids over this period Christian? I don't know, but but I was just thinking. You know, I, I think in one of one of our previous conversations, you were you were talking about um, the fact that the greatest thing that you could arm your son with is is a readiness for uh, for change. Um, you kind of stumped me. I'll have I'll have, I'll, I'll I'll keep that I'll keep that uh, working in the uh, in the background on an app in the background and, and come back to. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
No, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I mean, and and it's not an easy question to answer. So my son is, Mm. uh, what, 13, 14. And I put him on a call the other day with a friend's son who who did choose to leave home and go and do his sort of 16 to 18 education in a boarding school separately, uh, one of the uh, the, uh, UWC colleges. Um, And I did say say to my son, you know, what should you actually learn? Um, what's, what, what do you want to take away from this experience? And, 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 I was, uh, and I, at the end of the day, all I could think of is, is to prepare him for change, really. <laughs> um, yeah. I, you know, there's an odd thing getting to our age when you realize how much the world has changed. Um, I was watching, um, <laughs> I've got the, I'll, I'll make a confession here. So because I used to be a documentary maker, people sometimes ask me, what do you miss about making films? And there's really only one thing I miss, and that is make is watching old corporate videos. I love watching corporate film from the 1950s and 60s when everything is very certain. You know, we're going to put yeah. lead in petrol and it's going to be great. You know, we're all going to wear paper clothes in the future and we can just throw them away. You know, <laughs> this sort of fantastic naivety. And there's a, there's a series of books, um, which again will be familiar to you, Christian, and anyone from Britain, when we were kids, there were these books called the Ladybird books, okay, um, yeah, which course, were, yeah. where everything is very simple. This is a kind of a joke one about being a dad, you know, yeah. but the, everything was very simple inside. And I've been looking back over that, that sort of stuff in the last few weeks and thinking the world is not simple like that. I mean, it, at least in the 1970s and 80s when I was growing up, then there was you knew who the goodies and baddies were because there was a kind of nuclear bomb was pointed at us, you know. So there's obviously those guys are bad and we're good. Yeah. Uh, that's how it felt. And now the whole world seems a lot more complicated, <laughs> a lot more complicated. Um, and there you are know, lots of stuff of history for you and me that we were brought up to think was a jolly good thing. British Empire, jolly good thing. I'm not so sure about that. You know, I yeah. think in some at, ways, not at all, in some ways, you know, but actually there was a lot of stuff that we were never taught and yeah. which I feel quite ashamed about, frankly. So, yeah, yeah. the world's a more complicated place, isn't it? And um, yeah, are we? Um... You know, there, there has been, there's been a lot of talk about how you know, many now thriving uh, startups that are household names were, were founded around sort of 2008, 2009, when, uh, when the last time that the, uh, the proverbial hit the fan. Um, do you think that, that, there's, that now is a, is, a, is a good opportunity to, uh, to start something up? And, and if you were advising someone on, uh, on you know, founding a, a new venture. Um, would you suggest it should be something that's, that's playing on new opportunities that are arising out of this situation or, or simply, um, you know, stuff that seems good in general? Yeah, um, I think that, that uh, the, the perceived wisdom is that a down period is actually a very good time to launch a business because mm. Uh, if you you have to be incredibly lean and efficient when you do it, and that means that when the upturn comes, because it will come, it will come, mm. then you're ready to ride the wave upwards. Whereas if you launch at the peak of something with all of the kind of benefits of lots of money and everything else, then actually mm. you don't, particularly if you've never been through a recession before, you you don't know what it's like. Now, having said all of that, of course, none of us, uh, you know, there are people who were alive in the 1930s, less of them than mm. they used to be. Yeah. But none of us have lived through a kind of a depression uh, right now. Um, and uh, so, you know, that's the question is, 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 what do you launch in a depression that, that is useful to people? Um, and I guess to answer your question, you know, what, does the uncertainty of a period like the 2008 period lead to a kind of a, a Cambrian explosion of new businesses? I think it does. It, it shakes up stuff. When, when forest fires run through a forest, they clear away all the dead wood. Um, mm. play, plague and war, frankly, horrible to say it, but they've both been stimuluses for uh, stimuli for great change throughout history, haven't they? I think death in, in Europe, which killed one third of Europeans at the time, um, caused mm. a huge re- redistribution of wealth. So instead of you having yeah. money cascading down the generations from someone you know, who was rich to their kid who may not have been so clever or helpful to society and then going nice. down in an yeah. the money got redistributed so sometimes these there is a silver lining to these uh to these sort of thundercloud times um and and, and yes it can be a great opportunity to launch it to launch a business mm-hmm. well, well we see a lot of these companies that for the last few years have been um kind of a wash in money and uh, and have just been uh, uh spending uh, with with great profligacy in order to uh, 
to grow and grow and grow, but without any any sort of uh, of when um, when they're going to become profitable? Do you think that? There's well, that's an, be, yeah, that's an interesting right. thing, isn't it? I, I'm not sure how long that can go on. You know, there's the, there's mm. uh, someone made a good point. Um, you know, the a lot of the businesses that have grown quite large in the last few years have been online to offline businesses. They've involved a physical component that doesn't scale in the same ways as, as the previous generation of businesses. So if mm. you're a Facebook or a, or a Google, uh, uh, then it doesn't cost very much money to add an extra customer. It's a little bit more time in the servers. Mm. If you're an Amazon, it costs a bit more to add an extra customer because you have to deliver stuff, you know, so there's, there is a obligation that comes with that. Um, but not so much as a retail store, perhaps. And there, there are more economies of scale. Um, but for something like an Uber or a Grab, actually mm -hmm. the, the, the complexity of adding scale is, is, is more complex. And particularly if you're trying to do what all of those so-called super apps are trying to do, which is to be everything to everybody. Yep. They all, ev everyone wants to be a WeChat. Everyone wants to have a customer that just uses you as the main portal on the internet. And to mm. get to that point from being a ride-sharing service to being a, a decent payments company and a food provide, providing service and a travel agent and a everything and, 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 and yeah. uh, is actually really, really hard. Um, and I think what we're seeing is some fairly bad super apps at the moment um, uh, and, uh, and also concerns about um, surveillance capitalism when you give that much power to one company. So, mm. so I don't know. It, it's interesting to see whether I, those companies have had to take on a lot of um, – a lot of uh, investment in order to grow. Uh, can they create the returns? Yet to be proven. Mm. Uh, yet mm. to be proven. Um, so. Well, uh, speaking about super apps, but super in the in the meaning of uh, very very good. So can you tell us about uh, about your new venture and uh, you know that you that you dreamt up whilst uh, whilst there sure. at the, so, the resort locked away? Yeah, no. Um, was, well, was very it really happy. Just, just an experiment to, to see if you could get something off the ground. Well, what, hap um, what happened was a friend called me um, in the third week. So basically for me, when I first week of, of COVID-19 was, am I going to die? Ugh. Right. Second yeah. week was, how bad is this? I, I thought to myself, I looked out on the news and I thought, this is this going to be kind of a V-shaped recession or what is it? And I fairly quickly came to the conclusion, no, this is 1929. This is major. Mm. And so I was feeling a bit down at the beginning of the third week. And a friend called me up and said, Hugh, if you were prime minister, how would you restart the economy? And I thought that was a really interesting question. You know, when everything's shut down, what do you turn on first, you know, to get everything going? Because we've not had a situation where everything's closed down like that for since, you know, wartime. Um, so that led into a discussion then. And over about the course of, sort of half an hour, 45 minutes, we end up thinking, well, actually, it's all about trust. If you can't trust the people you're meeting and you can't trust the people around you to be safe and you have to do this social distancing thing, then we really can't get back to anything like normal. So the initial instinct of trust scan, as the company was called, was to create a kind of digital certificate that lets you get tested once and then be able to show to people that you're safe it's okay to come into a gym, it's okay to come into a shopping mall, it's okay to come into a, uh, uh, a flight. So we had this concept that there would be very widespread testing once the test technology becomes available um, and that people would need to demonstrate their test state. And actually mm -hmm. there were parts of that that turned out to be true and parts of that, that turned out to be false. This is a classic kind of startup story. What's ended up happening is that there are kind of safe bubbles where people feel safe, but they're kind of the size of states or cities so, for example, if you go to uh, Western Australia, they've got virtually mm. no COVID-19 now, mm. but they're mm. being still quite picky about who they let come in because they don't want that to change. So what's interesting there is it's not a sort of safe bubble that's the size of a gym or the size of a university campus or the size of an office block. It's a safe bubble the size of a state. And that's mm. created all sorts of confusion. And that, um, So within the safe bubble, there isn't really a need to test and, and show that you're okay it's when you move between the safe bubbles that's when you have a challenge so for example at the moment about three days ago uh, alaska the state of alaska announced that it would allow people with covid19 to come through the door however when you arrive in alaska you arrive in anchorage the biggest city and the mm. city of anchorage has set another set of rules and then when you try and tr travel you'll find actually the airline also has rules so if you fly with singapore airlines right now you'll find that you can only carry three kilograms on board the flight um okay. you can't use the overhead bins mm. so nothing is quite what you'd seem so doing a doing a trip like we used to just kind of going to the airport turn up somewhere like 
Singapore an hour before you fly, hop yeah. on, hop off. That's not going to be possible for a very, very long time. And if anyone remembers the 9-11 kind of time, immediately yeah. after 9-11, there were all of these sort of crazy rules. Some airlines you can take 100 milliliters, some people 200, mm -hmm. sometimes you have to have your shoes checked. It took years before all that settled down. So I think what's, what TrustScan's evolved into, and I'm still trying to decide whether this is something we should actually pursue, is a kind of a navigation business, really, to help people figure out how do I get through this complex environment? Um, you know, for the next few years, it's going to be the case, for example, for business travelers um, who are doing this. Imagine you're going to Singapore to the US. Mm. Maybe, maybe you do a stopover in Japan or a stopover in Europe somewhere. What kind of restrictions and testing are you going to have to face on the way? And, and what happens yeah. if the rules change the day before you fly? Or well, while, while you're, while in, you're the in the air? air. Yeah. Yeah. So how is that cope for? So you're going to need new kinds of insurance and things like that. So where TrustScan is going is into a business that's looking at that whole space. Um, and I'm still trying to evaluate whether that's something that, that I and the team around me are our best place to do or whether that's something that a, a, you know, a travel company or an airline would do better than we could do. So mm -hmm. watch this space on that one. OK. And any other um brilliant uh, ideas that that, that, you're, that you th or, or just opportunities areas where you think um there's uh, there's gold and then there are hills for the for the person who goes out there with a shovel well something i i can't remember if i mentioned this earlier on but um you know with more and more people working from home one mm. of the challenges i think for employers is going to be you know it, it won't feel very different if you go from employer a to employer b and you're still working from home your life is not going to feel that different. You're going to be using the same tools, sitting at the mm. same desk. So one of the things that employers are going to have to do is to project out the value add that they offer to talented people in new ways. So I think the kind of, you know, over the last 10 or 15 years, we've seen kind of Silicon Valley style offices with lots of, you know, free food and, yeah. and grass and all this kind of stuff to try and attract people in and make the working environment seem more comfortable. Well, now we're going to have to do that at home for people because yeah. they're not going to be in the office the whole time. So I think there's going to be a whole, you know, we, we, I wouldn't want to be in the real estate business now of any kind. It seems to me mm -hmm. that if you're a landlord um, with lots of shopping malls, um, you'd better start thinking about exiting from those fairly soon because mm -hmm. we're all using e-commerce and we're using it more and more and more. And then, you know, the nails uh, going in the coffin there fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I also wouldn't want to be in the real estate business renting out offices because people don't want that kind of office anymore much of the time um, so I think that there'll be a whole series of things to do with you know, what, what happens to training when most of your staff are working from home does that carry on the same mm. um, all of those kind of things uh, you know during a downtime a lot of people have time on their hands so I think there'll be a lot of opportunities around education and reskilling helping people figure out where can I add value into the future what are my career opportunities that's that's clearly something that people are going to want um, mm. perhaps escapism as well of new kinds. I mean, if we can't, if we can't physically go and visit places anymore, oh, I don't know about you, but I found myself watching YouTube videos about lighthouse keepers reapers. I'm making some real <laughs> confessions here, but I love that there's these weird videos on YouTube kind of shot in the 1980s, just before all the lighthouses stopped being, um, run by kind of old uncles, you know, and I was, I'm really interested in kind of what was it like living in a lighthouse? Um, so I, I'm kind of, I think at times when, when, when people feel um, unsure about the future, escapism is good, whether that's horror movies or entertainment, or if you're weird like me, videos about lighthouse keepers. Nice. Um, so escapism is, we need, we need cheering up. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, no, some, uh, some great ideas there, Hugh. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay. I think to go back to your question to me, um, oh, one of them was just running past, I could have asked her, but... Um, no, don't worry, darling. Off you go. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think you know one of the one of the important things that I hope my my daughters have have learned is uh, you know we're, we're all um, as I'm sure it's the same situation with you. We're isolated from um, our our loved ones in in other countries who we we had taken mm -hmm. uh, a little bit for granted that oh, it's easy enough to visit grandma and grandpa or um, or you know zip zip here, there, and, and everywhere to, to maintain those one-on-one -on -one contacts. And I think it's, it's kind of one of the um, counterintuitive things of this situation is that we, 
because we're isolated, we have become, you know, we've, we're reaching out more. You know, I'm, I'm having telephone conversations or S Skype, FaceTime, whatever conversations with, with friends who for years, most of our interaction mm -hmm. has been text messages and social media comments and, and all of that sort of thing. So um, I would, I, I hope that my children have learned that it's really important to maintain those relationships, especially with, uh, with you know, your, uh, your aged um, uh, loved ones, because they're-, they're It's funny, not, it's not funny you say that. I mean, I've noticed some of my younger mentees, by which I mean uh, students in their early 20s and so on, have been phoning me up over the last few weeks. And like, whoa, up until like three or four weeks ago, the only people who phoned me up in Singapore would have been over 40, you know? Yeah. But, but they've wanted to chat. And so that's really interesting. So perhaps, yeah, perhaps I'm one of those aging characters in their lives that they feel, gosh, she might not be around for much longer. <laughs> no, just, no, but just uh, the, the power of the conversation as well. Yeah, um, the power of the I've, conversation. That's absolutely right. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm loving it that, that we're now speaking to each other more. You know, I've received yeah. more, more telephone calls yeah. on my phone um, since I, I think I ever have since the advent of the iPhone. So it's, uh, it's going back a ways, but uh, yeah, it's mm. good. But it's, look, you know, it's been, um, it's been wonderful to speak with you, you today. Instagram only gives us 60 minutes to, uh, right. to talk on these things. And uh, I think we've used our time uh, very, very well today, Hugh. As I say, you know, always um, really interesting to speak with you. And, and uh, you know, most of our conversations in the past have been about what shape the future might take. Um, you know, we've hit a fork in the road, which is going to reshape some of those predictions, as you say. Um, but... Yeah, let's hope for the best and uh, make the most yep. of it. Opportunity comes out of chaos and uh, we've certainly got a bit of chaos right now. Uh, it's Indeed. been great talking with you. Thanks, Christian. Wonderful to speak with you, Hugh. Thanks again and uh, hope to speak with you again soon, perhaps uh, between a, a, plastic, a plastic screen for lunch one of these days. Exactly. All right. <laughs> Bye-bye for now. Good to chat with you. Thanks to everyone. Bye now.